By regulation, every lifeboat in Britain is called out on exercise once every six weeks. The Cromer boat is no exception. There has never been a shortage of men for this volunteer service. In fact, competition for a place in the crew is fierce. When the Maroons go off, the rush down to the boathouse always leaves some crewmen behind, deprived of the chance to set their lives at risk in order to save others. Being a lifeboatman is often something of a family tradition. The main lifeboat family at Cromer for several generations have been Davises. They still are. There's young Billy there. Father, Billy, another Billy here. Henry, Shrimp, myself. Yeah, I suppose there's, there's about nine of us now, we'll go to see. The present coxswain is Henry Davies, known to everyone as Shrimp Davies. And we, and we really had to go in lifeboats, you know, because father had been in lifeboats and all the family had been in lifeboats. Grandfather had been in lifeboats, great-grandfather had been in lifeboats. This is the thing you was brought up with. In a place like Cromer, and there must be many places around the British Isles, you naturally go to sea, fishing, you see. And I'm sure that these are the people who make the best lifeboat crews. Those who live in the place know this particular area, know their harbour or their beach. And these are the things that, uh, that matter, I think, you know, around the coast of Britain. And over the years, volunteer lifeboatmen have saved thousands of lives. In the Second World War alone, Cromer lifeboatmen rescued over 400 men. Whatever the weather, whatever the risk, they never gave up. The much decorated coxswain of Cromer's number one lifeboat was the legendary Henry Blogg. He too was a fisherman, like all Cromer lifeboatmen. There were times during the war when they were called out almost daily to rescue men from torpedoed ships, from ditched aircraft, and from ships on the treacherous sandbanks. There are many stories of their courage. This is just one of them. One day late in October 1941, a convoy of about 20 ships, escorted by destroyers, was steaming through the North Sea. One of them was an armed freighter of 3,000 tons, the English trader, bound for Mombasa with a million pounds worth of cargo aboard. During the day, bad engine trouble forced her to drop back from the convoy. And in the early hours of October the 26th, in the grip of a strong ebb tide and in a freshening wind, she ran foul of a sandbank. In her crew when it happened was naval gunner William Hickson. And my golly, there was a grinding sound. And uh, the engine stopped and a terrific clang underneath. Half of us went sailing across the deck, picked ourselves up. Dead silence. So, said to one of the chaps, I, you know, I don't know, sounds like we run across one of these sandbanks. There's plenty up here. And then there was shouting. I mean, it took two or three minutes, it seemed to me, that there was anybody doing any shouting. And then there was running feet. So I said, the one the other chaps, well, you know, I said, they'll shunt all of this lot in a minute, we get off. But there was no strength left in her engines. The English trader was stuck fast some 20 miles out to sea. And then a sudden storm blew in from the northeast. It must have been just getting light. I could see these white crested things rolling in towards me. It looked a long way off to me. It was probably hitting the edge of the sandbank. I sat down. And I saw my sea boots, all right, I'll take them with me, go back to the bridge. As I picked them up, there's a row like blooming thunder. Everything went a dark green. I knew what it was, it was a sea that hit the ship and it got right over the blooming gun deck. The storm was getting worse. A destroyer had dropped back from the convoy and was now standing by in case of enemy attack. But the real enemy was the raging sea. Unable to help in those conditions, the destroyer could only radio ashore and wait for the lifeboat. And in Cromer, coxswain Henry Blogg called out his crew. Among them, the young Shrimp Davies. Everybody, they drop everything, no matter whether they're having their breakfast, whether they're in bed, or whatever they're doing at work, everybody drops everything and chase down to the pier. And on this one in particular, 
you wonder, the thought comes, well, what is it this time? You know, is an aircraft down, is it uh, a ship on the sands, is a ship been torpedoed, this is wartime. These are sort of thoughts you have. But you chase off, whatever you're doing, you see. Some in the pyjamas, perhaps just the trousers over the top, pyjamas and things like this. And everybody here is down the pier. Everybody wants to be there. And the lifeboatmen who got there first that day were Walter Allen, nine members of the Davis family, and Kelly Harrison. I was called out at 5.20 past seven on the Sunday morning. So I just slipped my trousers over top of my pyjamas and went. You just saw the local go into the slipway and saying, well, they're gone. I don't know when we shall see them back. But we just had to hope and pray they did come back. You don't mind if it's not rough, but uh, when it's rough, we naturally you worry. The wives of Shrimp and Jack Davis know that lifeboatmen are reticent at the best of times. In wartime, even more so. They did say they were going out to the stands, didn't mm. they? Yes. Thought it was the sands, but of course it was a Lehman Bank. Well, not better. But it really was rough that day, wasn't it? There was a three-hour battle through heavy seas and squalls of rain and sleet. One of the youngest of Henry Blogg's crew that day was Dick Davis. We got the roughest uh, just, just before we got the Haysbury Sands, which is about halfway. We took a little bit of a risk on from the southwest or the middle buoy to the east buoy, which is about more than a bit. And uh, there were some big rolls when we didn't know what to do with her. Our second coxswain, Jack Davis, did in fact say, Henry, we're doing the wrong bloody thing. We must bow these seas. If the further we go this way, the more dangerous it will be. And so we, Henry turned around and then bowed these seas. So we crossed this uh, heap of sand and then got into deep water again and then carried on to Hammond's Knoll. Things were getting really serious for the English trader, lashed by sea and storm on Hammond's Knoll. There were nearly 50 men on board, and the captain ordered them all up to the comparative safety of the bridge. As the boatswain and a seaman went off to try and secure the only ship's boat that hadn't been swept away, William Hickson saw a huge wave about to hit them. And they turned round and they saw what was coming. And they, the sea was coming right over the boat deck this time, and that was a monster. It was a great green thing with a little white top to it, and there was nothing very big about it. But it was all sea and no foam on the top, or no crest. They both turned. We could see one holding on to the other and ran back, and they spotted this funnel stay. The boatswain must have grabbed it and held on tight, but the other fellow missed it. And the sea hit him then, and buried him underneath it. I could bury the boatswain underneath it, but it took the other fellow clean over the side. As he went away, we could see him on the back of one of these things, like a side of a slate quarry, tearing away from us. And he's floating on his back on the top of this thing, and he waved his arm. And this fellow's name was Joe Biss. And he had a, oh, what would you say, I think he'd yell out, instead of bawling out good morning to you, he'd say, taxi. He saw it up on the gun deck. Hey, gunner's taxi, <laughs> that kind of thing. Where we got that from, I don't know. But he raised his arm, and we heard him, well, we took it, to be just taxi. Taxi, he says. And he's on top of this massive great wave, and there's nothing we could do about it. And the boatswain's still hanging to this stay. They got the boatswain back to the safety of the bridge, but two more men were to be swept away before Henry Blogg and the Cromer boat got near. Henry had described it later as the most appalling sight he'd ever seen. This ship was grounded on Hammond's Knoll, and the only thing we could see were her masts, a funnel, and a bridge, and everything else was underwater. And great seas were breaking on her starboard side and on the crosser, and round her, round her stern and round her bow, and meeting on her port side, and thrown up into the air, all 60 or 70 feet. It was absolutely impossible to get near her. And we can see the sea's gone from right over the bridge, and I've never uh, 
I've never seen a ship in a worse predicament in my life. Now, we knew that if this ship was breaking up fast, uh, hatches were already off. We even saw a bowlers come out. A cargo was thrown on over the sea. And it looked as if another hour that she would be a total wreck. And so Henry thought we must make an attempt. But we couldn't, it was impossible to get nearer to within about a quarter of a mile. But he approached her on her port bow. This was on the lee side, of course. And then we tried to fire lines across her. Now, what they had to avoid, not only was there the sea, but there was their cargo as well. And that entirely littered the ocean. We had boxes, what? Big enough to carry, um, I mean, motor car in, I should think. Some of them. Some of them were small. It was an old margarine box type, you see, but it was tougher than that. On the sides of each of these was a great big stenciled letters, because they could make them. Britain delivers the goods while we were delivering them. Number one hatch contained a tractor, farm tractor. That came out of the hold and it went clean through the side. Tore a great jagged hole in the side and disappeared. So you can tell the force of the sea to lift a thing like that up. So, of course, the chroma boat, not only, as I say, did they have the sea, but they also had all this debris floating about. They make their run in. It's very good. As they came in towards, you see all the caps in their great life jackets and so forth, plowing through this lot, half hidden most of the time. Somebody raised their arm. A little puff of smoke. And we saw this steel shaft they fire on a line. Come straight toward us. Straight toward us. They had to get to the bridge. It was no good in getting anywhere else because we couldn't get hold of it, you see. They had to come across the bridge. And you got about halfway between the, the boat and us when it suddenly shot straight in the air and curled over back to them. Now, Cromwell Lightfoot had never failed ever to rescue a crew. And we began to think that this time we would fail. And so some of the younger ones, myself included, Jack, Kelly, Dick, Bob, said, well, let's have another try. But I know I was eager to have a go, because that was bloody nerve-wracking to sit there and watch them. And Henry said, and Second Cox and Jack Davis said, if we try, we shall do more harm than good. And we said, well, how can we do any harm? We've, uh, you know, we thought we had the best, well, we knew we had the best cops in the world. We definitely thought we were the best crew. And we knew we had the best lifeboat in the world. So what harm can we do? Anyway, he said, right, we'll have another try. We got to within about 60 or 70 yards of it when the biggest sea I've ever seen in my life threw up. And it raced past us, it just, some of it scooped across our fore part of the ship, across the forecastle, and it hurled on, and then it broke. Henry tried to turn the wheel to port, to bow it. I mean, steam up up it, fast, you see. One of the chaps shouted, the lifeboat's over. And the lifeboat was over and everybody abaft the midships went overboard. Troop's father said, hang on. But I grabbed the wireless mast, that's what I grabbed. 